Hey brother! Jay, it's time. New Pixar movie means we get to expand the ever-growing Pixar theory. And oh my gosh, I am like all but convinced that the people at Pixar are just in on it at this point in time because Incredibles 2 fits into the Pixar theory like a glove. Today, we find out how. <laughs> The Pixar theory, in case you don't know or just somehow accidentally clicked on this video, is a theory written by a guy named John Negroni that suggests that all of the Pixar movies live in the same universe on one giant timeline. Since the Pixar theory has been introduced, it has been interpreted in so many different ways across the internet, including our kind of like own unique take here on this channel. The timeline starts with The Good Dinosaur and ends with Monsters, Inc. Or Brave, depending on how you want to look at it and time travel. Throughout the timeline, we're going to see the rise of the humans and the fall of the humans, the rise of the machines and the fall of the machines, the return of the humans and the evolution of the humans into monsters. Yeah, you heard me, trust me, it all makes sense. And the other really important thing to know, especially for Incredibles 2, is that humans kind of serve as a power source. It's what allows toys to come to life. It's Wally's connection to humans that allows him to live on so much longer than all of his counterparts. In Cars too, the humans are gone and the machines are quite literally dealing with an energy crisis. And in Monsters, Inc., they are quite literally traveling to the human world to collect energy from humans. In fact, after Inside Out came out, we got a better idea of exactly what, or at least a better representation of what they were harvesting, first fear and then joy. But the question is, why did it shift from fear to joy? That is where The Incredibles comes in. In the Pixar theory, we believe that the monsters are traveling back in time and running on a parallel timeline to the human world. So as things change in the human world, it also changes which emotion is more powerful to the monsters. When they were harvesting during the time of the supers, they were going to a time period that involved so much more crime. So it only makes sense that fear would be much more powerful. Winston Dever in Incredibles 2 literally even says that the city is a playground for supers because of how much crime there is. It literally takes Elastigirl one day on the job to find a new supervillain. One day! So yeah, naturally during this period of time that they're harvesting, fear is clearly the most powerful emotion. But then what do we see happen next? Fear becomes less powerful and we actually see the monsters dealing with an energy crisis, despite the fact that two of the best scarers of all time are currently working at the factory. And by the end of Monsters, Inc., we discover that joy is a much more powerful emotion to harvest. But why the shift? What changed? Well, here is where Incredibles 2 comes into play perfectly. But first, let's start with Incredibles 1 and none other than Syndrome and his world-altering invention, the Omnidroid. The Omnidroid is so significant to the Pixar theory because it is the introduction of technology so smart that it starts to wonder why it has to take commands from humans. This is the same artificial intelligence that would eventually go on to found the company by and large, which we learn in Wally -E eventually takes over the entire planet and pollutes it so heavily that humans actually have to leave altogether. In the meantime, you can see it by and large spreading throughout the Pixar universe. First, you you can see the batteries that power Buzz. They're also responsible for the construction crew in Up, and they even maintain some control after the humans are gone on the planet, sponsoring some races in Cars 3. Interestingly though, they don't try to take over through violence, which is what Syndrome designed the Omnidroid for. Instead, they take advantage of extreme consumerism and basically just pamper the humans to extinction. Which personally, I have to say, doesn't sound like the worst way to go. But why are the machines doing this? What is their motivation? Well, as we said earlier, humans are responsible for being the energy source for the machines, so they kind of need them around to continue running. But most master villains don't take over by pampering their prey. Why are they going about it this way? The answer is because of one evil endeavor, the Screenslaver. To understand this, you need to know just a little bit of her backstory, so let's review. 
here's what happened. We learned that as a kid, her parents, and especially her father, loved supers, and even had a direct line to Gazer Beam and Vironix. One night shortly after the supers are outlawed, there is a break-in in the Dever home, and of course, the father goes to call the supers. However, because the supers had just recently been outlawed, nobody comes to their aid and her father is killed, even though they had a safe room that they could have used in the house. This moment leads Evelyn to believe that because the supers exist, people are going to rely on them for safety instead of kind of just using their own common sense. This same idea of over-reliance is further exploited by the family company DevTech, a telecommunication company that strips people of the yearn for their own experiences because they can just live vicariously through television programming. It's actually incredibly eloquent and kind of meta how the movie delivers this information to us, as the screenslaver is giving his monologue about how people have become mindless. What's happening on screen is this awesome action sequence of Helen basically trying to track down the screenslaver, and if you're not careful, you'll get too caught up in the sequence and miss what he's saying altogether. Personally, I was so mad when I realized that I had completely fallen victim to exactly this thing. I was actually complaining about how, because there's so much action happening on screen, I was totally missing the monologue, and that's totally the point they were going for. But that's exactly it. This is the point that the screen slaver is making, that people are over-reliant on supers and therefore they don't rely on their own resourcefulness for safety, and they rely too much on the television programming and therefore are stripped of any actual experiences. So her master plan is to use this exact idea against everyone. If everybody's already staring at the screen, what better way to get the message out? And again, she's doing the same thing with the supers. She's building them up, she's putting them in the center spotlight so that she can tear them down at exactly the right time. There's one conversation in particular that just nails the whole thing together. It's the conversation between Helen and Evelyn after they think they've caught the screen slaver, and Helen asks her what she thinks the people want. And what's Evelyn's response? Ease. People will always choose convenience over quality. This idea is parroting the monologue from Screenslaver earlier if you manage to catch it. You don't talk to people, you watch talk shows. You don't play games, you watch game shows. And it goes on like that for a little while. I don't know, something about like being on our phones too much, I think. The point is, Evelyn hates society's over-reliance on anything. She wants people to think and act for themselves. She wants to use their reliance on something to break them of it. So she invents things that make stuff so easy for everyone and then uses those inventions to demonstrate the harm that they can cause. And here's where it all comes together. The trouble is that she gets caught before her plan comes to fruition. So rather than people breaking away from everything they've become so reliant on, it just takes on a mind of its own. The machines go on to just make things easier and easier and easier for humans. And just like Evelyn said, people will always choose convenience over quality until they have literally evolved into nothing more than amorphous blobs sitting in chairs listening to machines, being slaves to screens. So going back to Monsters, Inc., why was Fear starting to lose its power? It's because on the parallel timeline, Fear is slowly being phased out. Machines are making things easier. Joy is so much more prevalent. In a nutshell, Incredibles 1 shows us how machines got their intelligence. Incredibles 2 shows us how they got their master plan. And Wally shows it all coming together. And this, this right here, if this isn't screen slaver tech, I don't know what is. Also, I just think it's worth bringing up that in both of the Incredibles movies, the villains have good overall messages. Like, Buddy is literally trying to prove that you don't have to be super to be special, that hard work can make you special. And Evelyn is just basically trying to get people to go out and have their own experiences. They don't need to rely on screens for that. But 
they're the bad guys. So the message is, yes, you need to be born super to be special and totally rely on screens. While I'm on that subject, you should totally subscribe to this channel. But guys, for my question of the day, have you guys seen Incredibles 2 yet? And what did you think? Be sure to leave all of your thoughts in the towel section down below. Also guys, I'm going to put a link in the description down below to John DeGroni's original Pixar theory. If you want to go and give it a read, it's absolutely amazing. He is so good at describing how everything comes together and you can just go check out how his theory ultimately differed a little bit from ours. But guys, as always, thanks for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you'd like some more Pixar theory action from us, you can click right here to find out how Coco fits into the Pixar theory. Or if you'd like to see our full spoiler review of The Incredibles 2, you can check out this video right here. But Jay, that's all I've got for you today, man. I will see you on Tuesday.